Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to ReachAbility's Reach Up program. Thanks for joining us. If you're new here and not sure what you're doing here or what to do with this, stay tuned until the end and we'll give you all of the information about how to get registered. If you've been here before, welcome back and we're so happy to have you. My name is Amanda and I'm one of the facilitators for the One Step Closer program. And our topic today is going to be all things communication. So if you've taken the One Step Closer program before, you'll know that this is one of our modules. So some of this might be familiar to you, but that's okay. It's always good to revisit topics a few times just so it resonates and gels with us. So I'm going to start by talking about one element of communication, which is how we're perceived by others when we're sending a message. And this is a really cool chart that we found that we talk about in program. And we'll put it up here. And it shows all of the different aspects of how we're received by someone else when we're sending a message or when we're having some form of communication. And this is actually quite surprising. So when we're talking to someone, only 7% of what we say is the spoken words. So the words that I'm saying to you when I'm communicating with you is a very minimal part of what somebody actually is hearing. 38% of what I'm saying to you when I'm communicating is my voice and my tone. And a whopping 55% is my body language. So what I'm doing with my body and with my facial expressions when I'm speaking to you. And this goes both ways too. When you're receiving a message, this is usually the three key elements that you pick out too. So we have our words that we use, our vocal tone, and also our body language and facial expressions. So think about what that means. This gets a little bit tricky when we're having communication electronically. And think about texting and emailing and how sometimes the intention of our message can get lost in those forms of communication. This is why, because so much of what we say is not the actual words. And we're going to do a little example of a practice with this. So I'm going to say a statement in a few different ways, and it's going to totally change what I'm saying based on how I say it, not just the words that I'm saying. So you might have heard that statement before, that old kind of assumption, it's not what you say, it's how you say it. Well, it actually really is true. It isn't just the words that you say, it's how you deliver them. So let's do a little bit of a practice. And the first statement is gonna be short and simple. And we're just gonna work with the sentence, I don't know. So I'm gonna say it in a certain way and then I'll identify how I'm saying that and really what, I'm, what my intentions are behind saying that. Okay, so the first way I'm gonna say to you is, I don't know. So if I say that to you, I, genu I genuinely am not sure. So it means I don't know what the answer to that is. I'm not sure maybe what you mean. I'm genuinely curious and I don't know. So it's kind of an authentic thing. So the next way I'm gonna say this is, I don't know. So if you read my body language and heard my tone and my facial expressions, that's me expressing anger or frustration. So if I kind of yell at you and say it in a really short um, or loud way, that might suggest that I'm angry or upset in some way. What if I say it this way? What do you think this means? I don't know. If anyone's raising teenagers out there, I'm sure they know exactly what that means. So if I say to you, I don't know, it usually means I'm annoyed or I'm disinterested. I'm not really paying attention to what you're saying. I don't really care about what you're saying. That's what it might signal. What about this one? I don't know. That might suggest to you that I'm feeling sad or that I'm feeling a little bit lost. So I'm, I don't know as in I don't know what I'm going to do next. I don't know what my next step is. I'm really unsure, but I'm really sad about it. The next one, what if I say it like this? I don't know. 
So that might signal to you that I'm hiding a secret or that I have a surprise for you and maybe you're hinting at it and I don't want to reveal it or tell you just yet. But if I say it like that, it might suggest that I've got something that I do know, but I can't tell you or I don't want to tell you just yet. So even just a simple phrase like, I don't know, can be taken in so many different ways based on how we say it. So if you noticed, I didn't change any of the words either time I made that statement. I said, I don't know each time, but it was just the way I said it. So what does that actually mean? It comes back to the chart that we looked at right before that exercise. It means that a lot of what we say is not the words. And I wanna make that point really clear because personally and professionally, this is a skill that can be used, but it can also be misunderstood. So we wanna be really clear and we wanna make sure we're aware of what our face looks like, what our body is saying, and what our tone and our vocal quality is also saying as well. So that's a really big part of communication. It's not what you say, it's how you say it. So the next part of communication I wanna talk about, number two, Who's ever heard this before? Leave us a comment if anyone's ever said this, or if you've ever said this to somebody, leave us a comment in the comment section. Think before you speak. I know I've heard that one lots of times, so I can certainly relate. But did you know that THINK, T-H-I-N-K, is actually an acronym for things that we can consider before we actually get our message across, or before we verbally start our communication? So thinking means going over in our head what we want to say, how we want to say it, and also who we're speaking to and how they might perceive us. So all great considerations. So the first tip I wanna give you for thinking before we speak is something called practicing the pause. So I'll give you an example. If you've ever communicated with someone and they're a really quick responder, or maybe you're a quick responder, and that's okay but sometimes we can respond or react to something before we think about it. And I'll give you an example. Let's say you're in the workplace and you're really swamped, you have a lot to do, but you're a people pleaser and your boss comes and says, hey, I have this extra project or this extra assignment. Can you work on it for me? You might immediately say, yeah, without even thinking of all of the stuff you already have to do. So if you respond and react really quickly, you might be overwhelming yourself by doing that. And it doesn't just happen in the workplace. This can happen in our, in our personal relationships as well. So practicing the pause means just taking a few seconds. You always have the right to do that. Or if it's a really big decision or a big thing that you want to consider, ask for some time. Say, I can't really answer that right now. Can I get back to you at the end of the day? Or can I get back to you tomorrow with that decision? You have the right to do that and you can ask for thinking it over time or even cool down time. So if you're in an argument or in a conflict with someone and you feel yourself getting heated and you're like, you know what, I'm feeling myself maybe going to say something I don't want to or I might regret. Just say, I can't continue this communication right now. I need some cool down time. And go to a different space, take some time, practice your pause, think about what it is that is the actual issue that you want to communicate, and then come back when you're feeling a little more settled and a little more cool. Okay, so we're gonna go over our THINK acronym and talk about what it stands for. Okay, so THINK stands for true, helpful, intentional, necessary, and kind. So these are five different considerations that we wanna make, especially if we're going into a conversation that's either life-changing or really important or going to impact a big part of our life, like a relationship or even a job. So the T stands for true. So we wanna consider before we say something, is this actually true? Do I know it to be true? Is it a well-known fact? Or is it something that I just heard from someone? Maybe it was gossip, or maybe I read it from a source that's not really credible. So considering, is this true? Is it a fact? And how do I know it? So even if you want to tell someone something that you don't know is true, making that clear is really important. I don't know if this is true, but I heard this. You know, can you comment on that? Or what have you heard? Or have you even heard of this before? The H stands for helpful. So is what I'm about to say to this person, 
Is my response going to help the situation? So are my words and how I say it, is this going to be helpful to them and to us and to this communication that we're having? Or is it going to be harmful? So that's a really good consider to make, or consideration to make before any interaction. Is this going to help the situation or harm it? Or it might be something that you need to say, but you were thinking of saying it in maybe kind of a harmful way or a way that could be taken as harmful and maybe readjusting what other words or how could I say this in a little bit more peaceful way or maybe even a little bit more accepting way. The I stands for intentional. So thinking about what your motivation is. What's motivating me to say this thing or to have this communication with this person? Is what I'm saying how I want to say it? So being really intentional, meaning meaning what you say and how you say it. Because I know I've certainly walked away from a lot of communications and conversations and I thought I wasn't my best self during that. And if you can relate, leave us a comment in the comment section. Talk about a time where maybe you said something, you don't have to say exactly what you said, but you walked away and thought, I really wish I didn't say that. Or I really wish I said that differently. Or why did that person react to me that way? I didn't think I said it in a bad way. That's a really common one too. So people can misunderstand something that you say and get really offended or upset by it and you're left really confused and you think, why did they react that way? I have no idea. I thought I sounded great. I thought I got it across the way I want it. So making sure we're really intentional about what we say and how we say it. The end stands for necessary. So is what I'm about to say really actually necessary or would it be better left unsaid? Do I have to say this thing at all? And the K stands for kind. And that one's kind of obvious. Is what I have to say something that I can say in a kind way? So THINK is a really good acronym. Of course you don't have to consider all five of these things before you say anything, but this is really useful when you're going into an important conversation or a professional conversation or something that might impact your life in a really big way. Okay, so the next part of communication is going to be something that we actually don't really think about a lot because we think communication as an exchange of words back and forth. So we're talking, the other person's talking, and messages are getting exchanged. But a huge part of communication is listening. So being a good listener is an art, and we call it the art of listening. So how do we be a good listener? Well, there are things that we can do, like not talking, of course, is one. That signals that we're listening. Making eye contact with the person is another way. Using some slight body movements, like a head nod or leaning into a person when they're talking to you, if that's comfortable. I know in the days of social distancing, that might not be the most appropriate, but it does show that we're listening. When we lean into someone, when we're making eye contact, and when we're really in the moment and present with them. There are some things that we want to avoid. So these are things that take us away or reduce our abilities to really listen to what somebody is saying. And I'm going to go over those. There's four of them. So number one is called judging. So judging is when someone's telling us something and in our mind, not out loud, but in our mind we're labeling them, we're judging what they're saying or we're judging their experience or even them as a person. Um, and when we do this, we're taking ourselves out of listening and putting our own assumptions into the situation. So we can't be fully listening to someone if we immediately start judging them in our heads. And also, it can affect how we're feeling. So if you're talking to me and I'm judging what you're saying, I might be getting myself upset or getting myself annoyed at you. And really, you didn't deserve that. So we want to avoid judging or labeling or making assumptions or generalizations about people when they're talking to us. And this is particularly useful because someone might get to the end of what they're saying and really kind of redeem what they were saying. So that judgment might have been really untrue because you didn't let them get to the end of their story or what they were saying. So you could prejudge someone, jump in there too quickly, and assume something. So we want to avoid that. 
The second thing we want to avoid is something called rehearsing. And this, I can certainly say I'm guilty of doing this before. Um, and leave us a comment in the comments if you can relate to any of these, because I certainly can. So rehearsing is when someone is talking to you and you're going over in your head what you want to say back to them or what you want to respond to them with before they're even done talking. So this would be a really useful, not rehearsing, but the skill of practicing the pause or thinking before we speak. That would be a really useful tool to help us avoid doing rehearsing. So when we're really engaged and really in the moment with someone, we're not going over in our head how we want to respond. Now, if you're somebody, let's say, who has memory issues or has cognitive challenges, that's okay. You can bring a pen and paper and write down the key points of what someone is making. I know I'm a note taker. I'm a hardcore note taker. So if we're having a really important conversation, I might be jotting down some notes just so I can stay in the moment with you, remember what you said, but not be rehearsing in my own head what I want to say back. So then at the end of what you're saying, I can take some time, practice my pause, and think about everything you said and how I want to respond. Um, so re trying to remember the key points of what they're, what they're saying to you um, and not going over what you want to say back in your head. Number three that we want to avoid when we are trying to be a good active listener is something called filtering. Again, I'm guilty of this sometimes. And filtering is when, think about what a filter does. So when we're filtering, we're only hearing what we want to hear. We pick parts of the message that stick out to us or maybe validate a point that we were trying to make. Basically, we're just checking in and checking out and we're only hearing pieces of what someone is saying. But if we are filtering, that means we're not paying attention to the whole message. And if we miss out on key parts, maybe we weren't interested in what they were saying, that's okay. You don't have to be interested in everything everyone says. But if you are having a conversation with someone and you're only picking out key points, that could lead to some really big miscommunication. So we want to avoid only hearing what we want to hear or only hearing parts and then making up our own story based on those parts. And the last part of listening that we want to try and avoid so we can be really strong active listeners is advising. Now, this one is really important because it's something that I don't see a lot of people doing and I don't do it often myself because it's a relatively new skill. I just learned it in the, la in the last few months and I am trying to practice it. So advising is exactly what it sounds like. It means if someone comes to you, this usually happens with friends um, or family members. If someone comes to you with a problem or an issue or a frustration and they're kind of venting it out to you and then you jump in and give them advice or tell them what they should do, or try and fix or solve their problem for them, you don't know that that's what they wanted from you. So when someone comes to you and they haven't clarified that, you know what, I just want a listening ear, I don't want any direction, I just want someone to vent to, or if someone comes to you and says, I really need your advice, can you give me some guidance or direction on this? Then it's clear and you know exactly what's expected of you and what your role in that communication is. But if it's not, it's okay to ask. So if someone comes to you and kind of starts firing off right away, that's okay. You can pause and say, I just want to clarify. Do you just want a listening ear? Do you want to just vent to me and I'll sit here and listen to everything you have to say? Or do you want my feedback? Do you want some direction? Do you want me to help you solve this problem? And that can clear up, um, give us a lot of clarity about what the person wants and what our role in this is. So those are four things we want to try and avoid when we're being an active listener. Number four, the fourth part of communication that's really important is expressing our boundaries. So boundaries are in every part of life um, and they're often one of the most overlooked things. And the reason why is because we usually don't figure out that we have a boundary until it's crossed. And when someone crosses our boundaries, we react or we feel really strongly about that, or we can. So usually we don't know our boundaries until they're crossed, and then we're kind of in a, in a conflict, or we can have really heated communications. 
So what a really good practice is, is getting to know what your boundaries are through your values, the things that you're willing to deal with, and really creating those statements that get those boundaries across. And we're going to work on that for number five. Um, but for number four, we'll talk about boundaries. So there's five categories of boundaries that people can have and that are healthy to have. Um, and we'll talk about what those are. So number one is material boundaries. This one's often forgot about. So this is boundaries on our material or our personal possessions. So material items, things that we own, could be big things like a car. Um, so our boundaries can be how they're used, if they can be used or borrowed, um, and how they're treated and when they're returned, if at all. So an example of a material boundary would be my car cannot be used on the weekend. So let's say you share a car or you're lending a friend a car and you work weekends so you need your car or you just don't want to lend your car on the weekend. That's okay. That's your right. And your friend comes to you on Saturday and says, oh, I have this really big important thing. Can I use your car? You've already set that boundary. So now you're in a position to either keep that boundary or make an exception or cross your own boundary. So again, your choice but setting boundaries in all areas of life is really important. The next category is mental boundaries. So this is when we're talking about our thoughts, our beliefs, our values, the things that we hold dear to us internally. So mental boundaries could be like our opinions, for example. That's a mental boundary. And I'll give you an example of what that might sound like. I respect that you disagree with my opinion, but please don't force your own opinions on me. So if you feel like someone's really trying to get you to see their side or get you to come over to their side or believe what they believe, you can say, I'm allowed to have my own beliefs and we're allowed to disagree. It's okay. I don't have to believe or have the same opinion as you. That's a boundary. You, you can agree to disagree and it doesn't have to be a big ugly thing. People think disagreeing is, is a bad thing. It's actually good. It means that we all have different perspectives and different thoughts on things. And if we all thought the same, we wouldn't get anywhere. So it's good to disagree, but do it respectively and set your boundary. So letting people know it's okay for me to have my opinion and it's okay for you to have yours. The next one is kind of similar to mental, but a little bit different, and that's our emotional boundaries. So the things that stir up our emotions or contribute to how we're feeling, factors that really contribute to our feelings in any moment. So this could be around inappropriate topics, so how we feel when someone is, let's say, for example, talking about something and you feel uncomfortable. Um, it could be emotional dumping, again, so if a friend or someone comes and vents and just is getting out all of their emotions and hasn't checked in with where you're at or if you're able to be that person for them. Um, or even dismissing emotions, so if you're telling someone how you feel and they're just like, yeah, okay, fine, whatever, and they're dismissing you, that would indicate that you might need to set a boundary there. So for example, a way or how this might sound is if someone's saying something and you feel uncomfortable or you're feeling like this is, an, this is super inappropriate, I don't want to be around this conversation, you can say, this isn't a topic that I'm willing to discuss. Can we change the subject or talk about something different? And boundaries are for you. They're not for the other person. So the other person has the right to say, no, I'm going to keep talking about this but then you have the option then where you need to leave the situation or make a decision on how you are going to stick to your boundary. Boundary number four is physical, of course. So we own our bodies, we own our physical space, and we need to communicate that to other people. And physical boundaries are going to vary. And what I mean is I don't have the same physical boundaries with my mom as I would a stranger. So everyone's going to have a different physical boundary with people in their lives, depending on their relationship and how they feel about that person. So physical boundaries are around proximity. So the area around you, how close people can get to you. Touch, of course. Who can touch you and where. PDA, so public displays of affection in relationships. That's another boundary that needs to be communicated. 
um, unwanted comments regarding your appearance or even your sexuality. So that has to do with your physical boundaries as well. Somebody making comments on your physical self. So an example of a boundary or what that might sound like is you're actually a little bit close to me right now. Can, can I ask you to back up a bit? Or if someone's making a comment about, let's say, what you look like and they're laughing, you can say, I actually don't find comments like that funny. Could we talk about something different? So expressing your physical boundaries, letting people know what's okay and what's not okay around your body and your space. And the last boundary is time and energy. So this is often a forgotten one. People don't think about, I need a boundary on how I spend my time and how I spend my energy, um, but very important. So boundaries around your time, around lateness, when to contact, if anyone's ever gotten a phone call at 3 a.m. and thought, oh my gosh, why is this person calling me? Um, favors and even free labor, so doing favors for people. And an example of a time or energy boundary could sound like, if you're going to be late, please text me, please text me next time and let me know. So maybe you were waiting for a friend um, and they weren't there and they weren't there and they weren't calling or texting you, weren't communicating with you. Now this would be different, let's say, if they forgot their phone and they got stuck in traffic. Um, but if they were just kind of like nonchalant about it and they were like, oh, I'm only a half an hour late, then that could be an indication that you might need to set a boundary there. So number four is expressing your boundaries and we just went over five categories of healthy boundaries and necessary boundaries that can really enrich our relationships. Okay, and the last one, and this one's gonna be part of our action for today, is called using I statements. And I'm sure you've heard of I statements before. It's a popular one, um, but it's popular because it really works. It's very effective for getting our point across. So when we're talking about I statements, there are four elements to creating an I statement. Now of course, not every single I statement needs to have all of these four elements, but if you want to be as clear as possible, incorporating these four can really be extremely helpful for making sure your point is exactly what you wanted to say. Okay, so the first way to start an I statement could be something like I feel. So saying, I feel, and then identifying an emotion or a feeling that you have. So I feel upset. I feel anxious. I feel nervous. I feel really down or sad, or I feel overwhelmed. So identifying an emotion or a feeling. So letting someone know how you're feeling because they might not know. The next part of the I statement is when. So you're going to say what it is that you're feeling in response to. So I feel really sad when I don't hear back from you after I've called you for three days. Or I feel really nervous when we go to this area of town because I have bad memories there. So explaining what you feel and when you feel it so that somebody really understands the situations that create that feeling for you. The next part of the I statement is because now this one's kind of optional. You don't always have to explain why you feel a certain way in certain situations, but it can be really helpful in your, in your personal relationships for people to fully understand where you're coming from. So you can say, I feel scared when I'm yelled at because I was yelled at a lot when I was in this job and it was a really toxic environment. So then the person's like, okay, I understand why they would feel that way. They weren't trying to upset you or make you feel scared, but you had that reaction and you've explained why and now that person fully understands. So again, you don't always have to say because, but it can be really helpful for somebody to fully understand where you're coming from. The last part, the most overlooked part of I statements is stating what you need. So what I need is. So ending your I statement with what you need to be different so that you don't feel that way in the future. So what I need is to not visit this area of town. Or what I need is for you to use a calm, gentle tone of voice when you're speaking to me. So stating I feel when, sometimes because, and what I need is. Okay, 
So I'm going to give you a few examples of these. The first one is this. I feel ignored when I'm talking to you and you're looking at your phone because it seems like you're not fully listening to me. I need you to make eye contact with me when we're having a conversation. So that one incorporates all four parts of the I statement. The next one, when I'm yelled at, so that one starts with when. It doesn't start with I feel. Those two can be interchangeable. You can state the situation first and then state how you feel. That's totally okay too. So when I'm yelled at, I feel angry and defensive because I see it as disrespectful. I need you to speak to me calmly. You can even state something that isn't about the person. So it could be a behavior that you're pointing out. For example, when a mess is left on the counter, I feel undervalued because I like to keep a clean house and I just tidied up that area. So moving forward, I need you to clean up after yourself or to try and tidy a space that you're using. Now, like I mentioned, this can also be used in a positive way for positive reinforcement. So using I statements to get behaviors that you want to see more of. For example, so if you want to validate a behavior that makes you feel good feelings and positive feelings and want more of that, here's how that might sound. I feel grateful that you did all of the dishes on my night to do them because I'm exhausted. Thank you so much. Or it could be, when you cook for me, I feel loved because it shows that you wanted to do something nice and I really appreciate that you did that. The last one, I feel relaxed and at peace when we go for a walk because I feel connected to you and nature and I need to feel connection. So I statements can work both ways for behavior that we want to set a boundary with, letting people know how we're feeling in response to whatever is happening, or picking out things that we want to see more of in a positive way. Okay, so our action for today is going to be try and create three to five I statements that are going to be personally useful for you in your life. So they can be I statements that you maybe wish you would have said before, or you know moving forward is going to be really important for you to set those boundaries or point out behavior that's going really well and making you feel really positively about. So three to five I statements and let us know. You can practice them in the meantime and see how they work out, but you can send us the three to five I statements that you've created. And try and use our four set formula, um, but you, you certainly don't have to. You can have the I statement sound like whatever you want. So however you want to formulate it, that's totally fine. Okay, so we've made it to the end, everyone. Welcome to the end of the video. If you are new, please stay tuned because I'm going to tell you exactly how you can get registered. If you've been here before and you're registered, you can hop off now and wait for that Friday email and we'll see you next time on our Reach Up page at 1 p.m. So if you're new here and you want to get registered, there's two ways that you can register. So you can email us at reachup at reachability.org and let us know that you're interested in our program and want to be registered or you can give us a call. So we do have people monitoring our phones and our phone number is 902-429-5878. So you can call and if we don't get to you, just leave us a voicemail and say, hey, I watched this video on Facebook about the Reach Up program. I'm not quite sure if I'm registered, but I'd like to be registered. And again, just to remind you that when you're registered, you are eligible for the grocery gift card. And so how that works is once you participate in five of our workshops, Reachability's Reach Up program workshops, participate means you've responded to five of the actions, then you get the grocery gift card. So how that works is on Friday, you're going to receive one email from reachup at reachability.org and it's going to have all of the modules for the whole week. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. You're going to have all of the recaps of the videos. So the whole video, the whole video from each day, you're going to have a one pager of the key points that were made and also the action for that day. And that's what you have to respond to. So you'll send us an email back. You can do all five in one week if you want. If you want to do Mondays, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Thursdays, and Friday, that's great. That counts as five. 
Another thing is if you didn't catch this live, that's okay. You can watch the videos at any time on our YouTube channel. So Reachability Association has our own YouTube channel. Check us out. And we've put all of our reach up sessions on there. So while you're waiting for that Friday email, you might want to catch up on the videos for the week. You can jump on over to our YouTube page and see all of our content there as well. All right, so we're here on Facebook every day at 1 p.m. Hoping that you're able to join us. Leave us a comment in the comment section if you have any questions or any thoughts on today's workshop. And we hope to see you next time at 1 p.m. for Reachability's Reach Up program here on Facebook. Take care and I'll see you next week.